thank you very much for introducing me and since I'm not going to deliver a speech, uh, but rather to say a few introductory remarks and then to engage in some interactive discussion. If you don't mind, I'll stay here. Uh, thank you to everyone who came uh, to this event, uh, which was very kindly organized by Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be uh, able to talk to you uh, this morning. Uh, the time is, I think, very right for frank discussions. Uh, the world is uh, without exaggeration. Uh, it's the turning point of history, new system of international relations, new system of managing the world affairs is emerging. Uh, the best manifestation of this is the activity of G20, uh, which reflects the objective trend uh, of a polycentric world being shaped in front of our eyes. When uh, more countries with economic and financial power and with political influence, which comes with it, become active uh, in international economy, international finances, and in international politics. And certainly the nature of the challenges and threats we all face uh, demands coherent, coordinated, collective action, uh, because uh, to think otherwise and to <coughs> think uh, and act uh, in in the logic of stereotypes of 19th and 20th century, I think would be a huge mistake. And of course, another uh, sign of the modern times is the uh, democratization. Uh, democracy is required, is demanded by people in the Middle East and North Africa and elsewhere. Democracy and the rule of law become the order of the day, but I would very specifically emphasize the need to respect democracy and rule of law, not only domestically, but internationally as well. So what is the <clears throat> place for uh, Europe, the United States, and the Russian Federation in this environment? I think it is important to ponder on, on what our role of the three uh, pillars and three branches of the European civilization uh, would be uh, today and tomorrow. I think for us to be, for the European civilization, which was spread by the Americans, I mean by those who immigrated to, the United, to, to America uh, westward, and was uh, spread by the Russians over centuries eastward, uh, thus creating this famous space from Vancouver to Vladivostok, I think it's in our best interest to make sure that we are competitive in the modern world, in the modern polycentric world. And from this point of view, we have to be united. We have to join resources, uh, join our uh, intellectual, uh, inventive, creative capacity. And I think this, is, uh, this understanding is getting through. Uh, not without problems, because old uh, habits die hard. Uh, but still, in Europe today, we witness that confrontational approaches give way to more cooperative stance, and more and more countries realize that it is in our, in our best common interest uh, to resolve the issues in Europe so that Europe is united, so that Europe doesn't have any dividing lines, which are, of course, heritage of the uh, Cold War, and uh, so that Europe feels one piece. Europe, I use this term uh, to refer to Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, after the Lisbon summit of NATO-Russia Council, after the OSC summit in Astana uh, last year, uh, very right words were pronounced by the leaders indivisibility of security, uh, strategic partnership, that was the motion uh, in Lisbon. The goal of building strategic partnership between NATO and Russia was endorsed by the leaders. They also said that they want to see the euro atlantic space based on indivisibility of security, predictability, transparency, mutual respect, taking into account the interest of uh, each other. Uh, 
Um, so it seems that everything has been agreed and that uh, exactly this, this movement towards unity uh, has been uh, endorsed. Uh, and some people ask, what do you, do you Russians need else? What else do you need? Uh, we believe that what uh, we all need, not only Russia, we need to make sure that these principles are really implemented in practice. Call it legally binding, call it, call it anything else, those very lofty words must be translated into practical deeds. And uh, you might recall that <clears throat> three years ago, President Medvedev uh, suggested that we all consider uh, concluding a treaty, European Euro Atlantic Security Treaty, which would codify <clears throat> the principle uh, of the indivisibility of security, the principle that no country should increase its own security at the expense of security of others. Those are quotations from many documents endorsed in the 90s uh, by NATO Russia Council, by OSC, uh, but the principle of indivisibility of security was never indeed made legally binding. Uh, but it is not just for the sake of making it legally binding that we talk about it. This principle was not applied in practical life. Uh, and I mean quite a lot of things which went contrary to the declared principles, including expanding NATO when the Warsaw Treaty disappeared, including uh, the violation of the commitment not to deploy uh, military infrastructure on the territory of new NATO members, and so on and so forth. Those were uh, commitments not carried out. Therefore, we believe that something must be done uh, for us to make sure that whenever we strike a deal, we implement it. Uh, this is a very old Russian tradition. Uh, when Russian salesmen in 15th, 16th century just shook hands, this was considered sacred. So maybe we are overly idealistic, but we still hope that people would keep their word. So what, what can we do now? And uh, what is the answer to the query? Uh, why do we need this treaty? And what in practical terms this would mean? Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the answer is uh, readily available. And the answer relates to the missile defense situation. The discussions on missile defense started in July 2009 when President Obama visited Moscow and together with President Medvedev they endorsed a statement saying that they would like to have a joint coherent uh, effort on missile defense, starting with common analysis of the threats and challenges, then developing common responses, and then implementing those responses if, God forbid, there would be a need for this. Uh, and there have been continued discussions between the American and Russian experts. Uh, there have been continued discussions in the NATO Russia Council. But so far, those discussions uh, did not uh, materialize in some agreement. But parallel with those discussions, facts on the ground have been created on the basis of the American design for missile defense, the uh, well-known uh, phased adaptive approach. And you know our analysis of that approach. Uh, we do believe that at the end of this uh, period uh, designated for the four phases, and no one is telling us that there would be no further phases. But at the end of the announced period of the four phases, the military infrastructure of this project would create risks for the Russian uh, strategic arsenals. And it's not a matter of uh, who is going to attack whom. Uh, we are not enemies. We said so in Lisbon very bluntly. We said that we are partners. But it's just a matter of uh, military planners uh, who are paid, you know, uh, for making sure that whenever something which can fire is next to your border, you must take uh, some compensating measures, as it were. So, missile defense situation is the crux of the matter of indivisibility of security. This is the material uh, manifestation 
of what we mean, among other things. There might be other material manifestations, but this one is just being formed, being shaped at uh, this very moment. So, uh, and this remains, I think, the single uh, irritator of considerable importance in Russian American relations, to which I come in a couple of minutes. So, we believe that what was agreed in Lisbon uh, should be implemented. And uh, the absolutely indispensable thing is to, uh, after we have said that we are partners, uh, to say the next thing uh, and to make sure that whatever we do on missile defense or on anything else is not, I mean, in the military, in the military uh, area, is not targeted against any of the participants of the Euro-Atlantic community. And that's what we uh, suggested to our uh, colleagues in Washington and uh, in Brussels, and we continue to discuss this proposal. So I believe that honest dialogue on things related not only to security but to economy as well, in this uh, Troika uh, format, uh, US, Europe, and Russia, uh, will uh, bring us a long way uh, to this uh, goal of Europe without any dividing lines, Europe without uh, zones with different uh, level of security, and Europe of common prosperity, I hope. Uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That very famous uh, ancient wisdom was quoted by uh, then president to be Abraham Lincoln in uh, 1858. I think it's very much relevant to the modern Europe. Uh, we do have some experience in uh, introducing the Troika format in practical uh, activities. Uh, the dialogue uh, between the foreign policy planning uh, departments uh, is being held at the level of foreign ministries. I mean, State Department, the Russian Foreign Minister, and the European uh, Foreign Service. Uh, but we need to do more. We need to embrace uh, additional areas uh, of cooperation, not just comparing views on how we perceive the modern world. Uh, of course, we uh, are not going you know, to enter as a member of what is called the Western uh, community. Uh, probably we are too big for this, uh, to become part of any uh, agreed format uh, which is existing in the Atlantic uh, area uh, and which is associated with the Western world. Uh, but we are the biggest partners of NATO and also the European Union. Uh, so we should not be really obsessed with uh, formalities, formal membership. We should concentrate on practical areas where the potentials of the three participants could be very usefully brought together to make us, one, I, I would emphasize this once again, more competitive in today, a very competitive world. Uh, and um, it relates to economy, it relates to uh, developing new technologies, it relates to uh, our ability to react uh, promptly and rightly to the unpredictable situations like the one we're witnessing in the Middle East and North Africa. Otherwise, uh, the time itself and history itself would overtake us. Um, my last point is the Russian-American relations. I alluded to them already. Uh, true, there, has been, there have been ups and downs. We are on the ups uh, stage now, uh, but even the ups stages are not without bumps. Uh, I alluded to one of them being missile defense. Uh, we do hope that we uh, can overcome it uh, and will be, as Russia, uh, doing uh, anything we can to achieve a fair deal uh, which would be based on equality, respect for the interest of each other, and the respect for the security concerns uh, of each other. We have achieved a lot. The START Treaty, the 123 Agreement, uh, the creation and very active functioning of the Presidential Commission with 20 working groups, 
the two groups were lately added uh, on uh, innovations and on the uh, legal issues. Uh, we began to cooperate more actively in uh, such fora as APEC, uh, G8, G20, the United Nations, in spite of the fact that on some things in the UN we disagree, uh, only to mention the uh, resolution 1973 of Libya. Uh, but we should not be complacent with what we have achieved. I think we uh, must put new ambitious goals in front of the two countries, the goals which would not uh, ignore the interest of Europe. Uh, and uh, there are no such uh, goals, I believe, which would, in the Russian-American uh, context, which would be detrimental to the European security or Euro European development. Our immediate uh, task is to finalize a very uh, protracted and famous WTO accession. We are sick and tired of uh, new and new demands, and uh, I think it, it, we are <coughs> closing uh, a moment, uh, nearing a moment of truth, uh, and it would be very unfortunate if uh, the truth would be negative rather than positive. Uh, I mentioned missile defense, which we have to resolve if we are responsible uh, members of the uh, international community. But we also have to put in front of us the goals which would be immediately felt uh, by our citizens. And I will just mention the agreement between the two presidents when they met uh, in the margins of the G8 summit in Deville uh, to start working on an agreement on visa facilitation, uh, which is ready and which we will sign very soon. Uh, it will uh, provide for businessmen and tourists to get multiple visas uh, for three years, and for the uh, officials of the two governments to get one year uh, multiple visas. Uh, besides, when Vice President Biden uh, visited Moscow uh, last uh, spring, uh, the goal of visa-free regime was put forward by uh, the Russian leadership, and uh, uh, President Biden said it's a good idea. And uh, I think he wasn't joking. Um, only two years ago, such thing would be unthinkable. But uh, I'm not saying that we will move to visit the regime tomorrow, but this is a realistic goal. It will take time, like it takes time to move to visit the regime between Russia and uh, the European Union. Uh, with Israel, we reached the visa free arrangement much, much faster than with Europe. I hope uh, the similar arrangement with the United States would take not longer than the European-Russian uh, deal, but much uh, less time. Uh, and uh, of course, we finalized a very important agreement on adoption, on cooperation on the issues of adoption. Uh, it's a good agreement. It's an uh, agreement which is equal, which uh, provides uh, for instruments to monitor the fate of the adopted kids. Uh, and it uh, prohibits uh, adoption by uh, individuals uh, independently. A certified U.S. competent organ would be involved and would be responsible for the decisions taken uh, on adoption of the Russian kids. I think I stop here. Uh, one last thing probably. Uh, when I say we need to do more, uh, which would be immediately felt by our citizens, and this of course relates to Europeans as well, the Americans to the Russians, and um, if we are guided by this goal, I think we would achieve much more uh, compared to a situation when we make the potential uh, useful, mutually beneficial agreements hostage to domestic electoral situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Lavrov. One of the really seismic events that uh, has great effect on Europe, the United States, and on Russia has been the Arab awakening. And there have been differences in policy and in approaches, uh, both in terms of Libya 
and continuing certainly on Syria. I wonder if you could address opportunities um, that you see for closer Troika cooperation in resolving both the situation in Libya and in Syria. Well, I think it's a very good question. And uh, uh, when uh, Europe, the United States, and Russia are together, uh, when we also uh, bring China uh, to our common position, and if the three are together, China would almost always would be very much eager uh, to join the club. Uh, and this is important because uh, this format, with China in it, includes all five permanent members of the Security Council. And whether we like it or not, but this uh, charter provision is still very, very important uh, for the international community. Uh, yes, sometimes uh, people blame the P5 for uh, either not doing anything or doing too much, uh, for either uh, imposing reforms or blocking the reforms, uh, but this is the cornerstone of the United Nations, uh, which made it so successful compared to the League of Nations, which didn't have the mechanism of, of the permanent members of the Buddha. That's why the Americans left. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, a very bad thing for Europe, after all. Um, so, uh, the key to the success is for all of us to start by developing a common position. It's the same as with missile defense as with anything else. Uh, when we agonizingly, uh, painfully negotiated for almost half a year uh, the last resolution on Iran, we reached consensus in the P5, including consensus between the European Union, the United States, and the Russian Federation. The resolution was adopted immediately after this. The United States and the European Union, some other countries, introduced unilateral sanctions in addition to the United Nations sanctions. And whatever was not possible for them to negotiate in the Security Council, they just added, you know, a la carte, uh, individually. I think this is the wrong approach, uh, because we have been hearing the appeals to us, to the Chinese, we have to be uh, together on Iran. We have to show our unity and solidarity. But does it mean that you cannot detract from the agreed product, but you can add to the agreed product if this product is sanctioned? I don't think so. Uh, not to mention that many American sanctions are extraterritorial, targeting among others, the European and Russian countries. And the Europeans, last time, Iran was topical in the United Nations, uh, end of the 90s, I think. I think the European Union negotiated with Washington a deal whereby the European companies would be exempt from the unilateral American sanctions if respective companies uh, abide by the Security Council resolutions, but do not necessarily fit into the American legislation. Well, at least we want the same. Uh, but we still cannot, cannot uh, get there, though quite a number of uh, undeserved sanctions on the Russian companies have been uh, removed during the last year. And I pay tribute to, to the administration, which uh, understood the importance of, of moving in this direction. So uh, when the Libyan situation evolved, uh, or rather erupted, <laughs> Uh, we all joined consensus on Resolution 1970, declaring uh, total arms embargo, declaring the goal of immediate cessation of hostilities and beginning of the political process. And Russia voted without any hesitation because we condemned, together with all others, what Gaddafi was doing, using uh, heavy arms and uh, airplanes uh, against uh, his own people. Uh, the resolution didn't help. Gaddafi continued to do what he was doing. Then the Arab League requested uh, to uh, requested from the Security Council to, uh, inter uh, to to declare the airspace, the Libyan airspace, a no-fly zone, and we supported this goal because, as I said, it's uh, absolutely unacceptable to use air force uh, to kill civilians. Uh, and then the resolution was negotiated with this goal as its centerpiece. Uh, the only problem we had with that resolution was the paragraph saying that anyone can do anything uh, to uh, 
ensure uh, the uh, goals of the resolutions uh, being implemented, that, that the goals of, of the resolution are implemented. Uh, we want, together with China, Germany, India, South Africa, uh, we wanted to specify who is going to volunteer uh, to deliver this no-fly zone regime, what would be the rules of engagement, and what would be the limits of the use of force. I think it was a very fair request. It was ignored, uh, and uh, the draft resolution which we introduced, demanding under Chapter 7 immediate ceasefire, was also uh, not supported. Uh, so we didn't have any other choice but to abstain, unfortunately, because had we had the co-sponsors uh, given it a bit more time to negotiate, uh, not a carte blanche to anyone to do anything, but to negotiate the means uh, necessary to ensure the no-fly zone regime, it could have been a consensual resolution as 1970. Uh, now Syria. It's a different story. Uh, for many reasons, I, I would not, I wouldn't really uh, go along explaining why, uh, if only for the, for, the, for the important Syria place in the region and the connections with so many regional uh, aspects uh, which are very important. Uh, before even suggesting that the Security Council should do something, the United States and the European Union introduced the unilateral sanctions. Not once, several times. And then they said, well, we need to do something in the Security Council. There was a European resolution, the French-British resolution, draft resolution, uh, which basically said that uh, the entire situation in Syria is because Assad uh, doesn't want to do anything. The opposition uh, is fine, and Assad must, must, must. On the basis of the information we have uh, had from our embassy, from other sources, uh, we knew that this is not entirely uh, true. Uh, the opposition was not entirely peaceful. Uh, among peaceful demonstrators, who were of course predominant, there were uh, people who were armed and who were provoking violence. So we suggested that the international community, in, in, in the form which would be acceptable to everyone, should should address both parties and should tell Assad, well, we heard your promises of reform, this is right, but you must implement those reforms in practice faster. That's exactly what President Medvedev told President Assad during the uh, several phone conversations in the last couple of months. But we also have to tell the opposition, you should not uh, provoke violence, you should not resort to violence yourself. You should not count on uh, the repetition of the Libyan scenario, and you should not ignore the proposals for dialogue, the proposals uh, for the discussion of reforms coming from uh, the government. Uh, what was already done by, by President Hassett was uh, the removal uh, of the emergency law, which had existed for decades in Syria. Uh, Two amnesties was announced, were announced. Uh, the uh, national dialogue was proposed and I think started yesterday and it continues today. Or rather, it should have finished yesterday, I think, maybe they continue. And it's good that a uh, considerable uh, number of opposition uh, forces, parties, uh, came to that dialogue. Uh, the president of Syria proposed a set of uh, legal reforms, including constitutional reform, including electoral reform, reform, reform of the legislation on the media, this should not be rejected. This should be engaged. Uh, because we have seen only too often uh, the uh, prevalence of the logic of isolation over the logic of engagement. Be it in Iran, be it in Syria in the past, uh, when Syria was isolated from, from the mainstream of the uh, Arab uh, community. We've seen Hamas having been isolated after it won uh, free and fair democratic elections. Uh, we have seen the attempts to isolate Hezbollah in Lebanon, which brought nothing good to this country. So, as a matter of principle, we are against isolation. We are for engagement. At the end of the day, the Iranian issue can only be resolved through engagement. And that's what 
the three plus three group reiterated a month ago in its statement, that we need an approach which is based uh, on uh, uh, step by step logic and reciprocal logic. Uh, so I think that we should act on Syria no less responsibly as we all act on Yemen. No one is pulling Yemen, you know, into the Security Council. By the way, no one lifted a finger when the presidential uh, office was shelled by the rebels in Yemen, with the president uh, almost being uh, killed, and with uh, the top government officials and uh, parliament officials uh, who have been who had been in the, uh, on the premises uh, also wounded severely. <laughs> no one can bend this. Uh, I mean, on the Security Council. Individually, several countries did. Uh, but now in Yemen, the United States, Europe, Russia, UN, um, <clears throat> Gulf Cooperation Council, everyone is saying, well, you must sit down and talk to each other. You must discuss this roadmap. Uh, I think uh, the Syrian situation is absolutely deserving the same, the same trip. Even in, on, even in Libya, Things are moving in the same direction after the failure of the uh, reliance on uh, military solution alone. Foreign Minister, you, uh, you came to Washington as part of the quartet meeting. I'm told it was a difficult session yesterday. Would, would you be willing to share some of your perceptions on this and how you see this unfolding? Well, I wouldn't say it was a difficult session. First, the wine was very good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was no disagreement uh, on the matters of principle. The fact that we didn't produce a statement doesn't mean uh, we uh, disagreed and uh, just uh, abandoned the effort. Uh, our experts continue to discuss it, and they would take some time, no doubt, about this. But we have the same desire. This is the predominant desire uh, to see Palestinians and Israelis returning to the negotiating table and beginning to talk to talk substance. Uh, yes, starting, as it were, with the borders and security, but very clearly spelling out that Jerusalem, refugees, water, and other uh, final status issues would be discussed in the context of the eventual comprehensive deal. And uh, we know what Israel thinks, we know what Palestine thinks, uh, and I don't believe that the gap in their positions is really uh, insurmountable. At least we as the quartet, uh, which is accepted as mediated by the parties, by the United Nations, by the international community in general, uh, could produce uh, a position which would basically achieve the following things. First, uh, it must not deviate from the existing, uh, broadly accepted, universally accepted legal basis in the form of Security Council previous resolutions and the form uh, of the uh, Arab League Initiative, the Madrid Principles, the Roadmap. Uh, this is the foundation. Uh, and two, uh, the position to be presented by the Court of Hope pretty soon uh, should uh, reflect the specific uh, demands by each of the parties. Uh, everyone says sit down and talk without preconditions. Um, uh, Israel believes that Palestinian insistence on the settlement freeze is a precondition. Palestinians believe that when Israel says we would discuss without any conditions but your state would be demilitarized, uh, we would protect your uh, airspace and we would protect your waters and we will keep our military in the Jordan River Valley. The Palestinians say that's something from, from somebody who says no preconditions. So, but we understand how crucial security is for Israel. We also understand how crucial a statehood is for the Palestinians. And um, the exercise yesterday uh, was not intended, uh, you know, to uh, hectically produce something which could be used to tell the Palestinians, you see, you have this from us, you shouldn't go to the United Nations, there is no need to go to the United Nations. Uh, I wouldn't support this. It's, it's their country, it's their right. 
but of course we talk to the Palestinians, uh, to Fatah, to Hamas, and of May, uh, all Palestinian factions after the deal in Cairo on the re-establishing of the Palestinian unity came to Moscow and met with them. They all say, we want negotiations. We want 967 borders, including Hamas, which means, which implies the recognition of Israel. The recognition of Israel's right to exist. We shall not ignore these things. We shall not continue the logic of isolation. We shall, we shall not be maximalistically, you know, demanding. The quartet criteria must be adopted tonight before anything else happens. They are moving towards this uh, criteria. They accepted the Palestinian unity on the basis of the platform of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which recognizes it. So I think uh, it's, it's the famous problem of the glass half full or glass uh, half empty. Uh, but it is not just uh, um, casuistic terminology. Uh, it's an issue of crucial importance. And we must not neglect uh, even the minimal progress uh, in the right direction. So, uh, I, and we received uh, the member of the FATH uh, leadership uh, a few days ago, Nabil Shahs, in Moscow, who confirmed very strongly that uh, the UN exercise is not going to be the substitution for negotiation. So it all, it all depends on what you say in the resolution which you want to adopt. Um, but in a nutshell, we agreed tomorrow that we see things very closely, that we all believe that what President Obama said on May 19th is a basic statement from the United States, and that it should be incorporated uh, in the common position uh, with the language to be to be fine-tuned uh, with the participation of the European Union, United Nations, and Russia. One issue that certainly has been of great um, conversation here has been Russia's accession to the WTO. And certainly uh, the American administration is supportive, uh, as is the European Union. However, uh, there are some uh, real hang-ups with regard to the U.S. and the U.S. Congress, um, particularly Jackson Bank. Could you speak a bit to what Russia can do moving ahead, assuming that America cannot, in fact, back um, WTO accession? Can not back? No, no, can back it, but cannot uh, ratify compliance. Well, if, if uh, the United States uh, would not ratify, uh, I mean, if, if Jackson Vinick is there, the Americans cannot uh, enjoy uh, the regime which Russia would provide to other members of WTO where they enter the Russian market. That's the answer. Absolutely. So it's their loss. Well, I think so, and they know it. But uh, I mentioned the WTO thing in, in my uh, introductory remarks. Uh, we are very close. We thought we were close a year ago, uh, last September, actually. Uh, uh, before that, in 2006, we signed uh, with the Bush administration uh, the, the final deal bilater uh, bilaterally, uh, only to see it re-signed last September. Uh, new and new things are popping up and popping up. And the same is true with the European Union position. We finalized our bilateral negotiations with the EU back in 2004. That was one of the first events when I became minister. There was a Russia EU summit in Moscow. And it was crowned by a deal on WTO, only to see uh, the resigning you know, uh, last year. Uh, so if, again, our partners would, I understand that this is an important thing because it's about money, it's about access, it's about your uh, producers, uh, and negotiations are very tough. Uh, maybe tougher than on the uh, START Treaty. You know? <laughs> uh, because everyone understands that there would be, there would be uh, some commercial, some financial consequences. 
but uh, when uh, our Minister of uh, Economy and Development uh, was uh, here a few days ago, they negotiated uh, with the American uh, counterparts. Almost everything is closed. Now it's about pork, pork meat. And uh, some of the partners with whom she negotiated even use the expression, you are 20,000 tons of pork meat away from WTO. Why don't you? <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really fine. I think we should turn, turn to the audience. Uh, first, I've, I've, I've made a mistake. I failed to recognize the best. Thank you for coming today. Um, colleagues, uh, I think we're, are we going to pass microphones or are we going to people up? Okay, so signal, if you, if you have a question, why don't you come up to the microphone. Uh, Questions, no statements. I'll cut you off if I start hearing lectures, <laughs> okay? Thank you so much. My name is David Mukarati. I represent George. I don't think it's so. Yeah. Oh. Can somebody yeah, let's, let's bring this mic over if we know it works. And let's make sure that we got that. Okay, it's up. Great. Thank you. My name is David Mukarati. I represent Georgian television station Rustav in Washington, DC. I would like to follow up on WTO. It was a third round of negotiations in Switzerland a couple of days ago where Georgia demanded international monitoring on trade. Uh, what is Russia's position and do you believe that this uh, issue will be resolved with Georgia? Thank you, sir. Well, if, if we all concentrate on WTO rules and uh, do not uh, go beyond those rules into some uh, politics, uh, yes, it's, it's uh, very much doable and we responded positively to the Swiss uh, proposal to mediate those Russian-Georgian discussions uh, to finalize the WTO issues. And the Swiss uh, produced uh, a paper for the Georgians and us to consider. We think uh, the paper is uh, logical uh, and conceptually it's right because it does not uh, deviate from WTO agenda proper. The uh, customs control uh, on the Russian borders uh, can be uh, transparent. This is what the Swiss suggested. And this transparency can be ensured the way which satisfies everyone. I don't want to go into the details. But yes, if, if politics uh, uh, don't interfere, it's not very difficult to do. Can I ask people to turn off their cell phones and put it on silent stun, OK? Uh, Bill Nitzi, and then please just work up to the microphones. We're gonna, I think it's probably going to be easier that way. People seem to be good. Uh, Mr. Foreign Minister uh, Phil Nitza, I'm a small businessman who used to work on Arctic issues, among others at the EPA. And I'd appreciate your perspective on, or the Russian perspective, on the proper international regime, regime for development of the Arctic, with particular reference to sustainable uh, development of natural resources, uh, freedom of navigation for commercial vessels, and avoidance of uh, military conflict, particularly regarding uh, submarine forces of the various countries. And perhaps you could also comment on the Arctic Council and the Law of the Sea Convention. Thank you. Well, actually, you answered your own question. The international <coughs> regime for the Arctic exists. Uh, this is the International Law of the Sea Convention. This was uh, very unambiguously stated by the Arctic Five, uh, the five uh, coastal states. Um, Russia, U.S., Canada, uh, Norway, and Denmark. Uh, when uh, we met at the ministerial level in Greenland in May 2008 and produced the Nuuk Declaration of the Arctic Five, this was very strongly reiterated by the Arctic Council at eight members already. Uh, we don't see any problem in the Arctic which could not be resolved uh, through the existing mechanisms and on the basis of the existing international law in the uh, form of the International Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, the proof to this, if anyone needed the proof, was the uh, negotiation, I mean, uh, conclusion and ratification of the Russian-Norwegian Treaty on the limitation in the Barents and the North Sea. And, um, that's basically it. Uh, sustainable development of natural resources is, first of all, the responsibility of the Arctic state, states. Uh, we don't 
uh, avoid cooperation with countries who are not members of the Arctic Council. And uh, only last May, a month, two months ago, in Nuuk again, the Arctic Council met and uh, adopted the rules of the game as far as the uh, non-members participation in various projects is concerned. Uh, this, uh, I mean, the, the, the criteria to become an observer uh, has been, uh, have been spelled out in so many details. And observers can easily participate in development of natural resources. They can enjoy the freedom of navigation, uh, including, you know, to bring, uh, to, 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 to ship uh, oil and gas uh, through the Northern Sea route. Uh, observers can, of course, participate in research, scientific research, and uh, other activities. Uh, we don't see any problem in, in the Arctic which would require a military solution, and this is the position of the Arctic Council members. Uh, so it's really about uh, cooperation. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Please identify yourself. <coughs> Arshad Mohammed of Reuters, uh, Minister Lavrov, <clears throat> on Iran. After the Iranians' uh, unwillingness to take up the Tehran research reactor proposal, uh, and after the uh, lack of success in the round of talks in Istanbul, could you sketch out for us what kind of a diplomatic initiative, what kind of uh, engagement you think is likely to draw the Iranians into a serious discussion about their uranium enrichment program? Well, first on take around the research reactor. It's, it's not uh, a substitute for the solution of the Iranian uh, nuclear issue, but it's an important thing which, if, if uh, resolved, uh, would uh, serve as a very important confidence building measure. Um, president Medvedev, together with President of Kazakhstan, met with President Ahmadinejad uh, on June 15th in Astana, in the margins of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. And we sensed um, the uh, readiness of the Iranian leadership uh, to resume negotiations, including on the Tehran research record. Uh, again, uh, you know, it's, it's about uh, engagement, and it's about uh, negotiators to be guided not by the wrongly understood prestige considerations, but by the substance, and the substance is very important. And uh, we need not to uh, say, well, we'll wait until they blink. We have to be more, more creative and more inventive. Uh, on the Iranian nuclear issue uh, in general, which also fits into the approach I described, uh, Secretary of the Iranian Security Council, Mr. Jalili, some time ago, addressed a letter to uh, Kati Ashton, the high representative of the European Union, uh, suggesting that Iran is ready for resumption of negotiations, uh, but not mentioning among the subjects the Iranian nuclear issue itself, which is, of course, uh, not what we all need. Uh, but uh, Kati Ashton sent a reply to him on behalf of the 3 plus 3 group, uh, which said, Yes, we are ready to negotiate, and uh, she explained that everything would be on the table, including, of course, the most important thing for us, the Iranian nuclear issue. But the Iranians, they must, understand, they must know whether uh, the negotiations are just to resolve the uh, questions which are still remaining uh, with uh, International Atomic Energy a Agency, uh, and if this is the case, uh, whether the 3 plus 3 will deliver on our previous commitments, that you resolve all the problems, you restore the confidence in the entirely peaceful nature of your nuclear program, and you would be a normal uh, non-nuclear member of NPT enjoying all the rights. If you fulfill all your obligations, you will enjoy all the rights, which includes the right to enrich, just be frank about this. Uh, but the Iranians uh, keep asking questions whether the Western participants of the 3 plus 3 really uh, are really sincere and whether they are not having a different agenda which uh, is not limited to non-proliferation tasks, uh, but is about, you know, isolation of the regime and then eventually the regime change, uh, if not the use of force, which was mentioned so, so many times by so many uh, people in uh, two or three countries. Um, 
we have been trying to make sure that uh, some sort of a roadmap uh, to implement the 3 plus 3 proposals delivered to Iran a couple of years ago is discussed. And last November, we suggested to our 3 plus 3 uh, partners uh, a non-paper describing an approach which would be, uh, could be, could be descri described as you know, action for action. Iran makes a step towards uh, implementing the requirements of IAA, and we do something in return. Uh, lowering the uh, to make to make the uh, pressure of sanctions lower. Uh, then Iran makes another step, which I wants it to make, and we respond in kind again. Uh, it's being considered now. It's uh, taking some time, but uh, most of our partners, including Europeans and Americans, uh, promise to look into it uh, and to to see how we can use it. Question, please. Good morning. I'm Maciej Pisarski, uh, Polish DCM. Uh, here, uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Minister for a very interesting presentation. And since this event has a strong European touch, let me ask a question about Russia-EU relations. Uh, Poland, uh, Poland is holding an uh, EU presidency these days, and uh, we certainly hope very much that uh, during uh, this presidency, a new framework um, of cooperation between Russia and the European Union uh, will be established. And uh, more specifically, uh, we would welcome any uh, uh, actions, uh, moves towards uh, signing a new partnership and cooperation agreement uh, with Russia, also developing the holistic um, EU-Russia uh, <coughs> partnership for modernization uh, uh, project. And, uh, and also, uh, we would like to see uh, progress uh, uh, in the Polish-Russian uh, initiative to include the, the whole uh, Kaliningrad region uh, in the framework of, uh, of facilitated uh, travel restrictions uh, under the small border uh, uh, movement. So I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Minister, how do you see the uh, prospects for achieving, uh, achieving uh, progress in this, uh, in, in this field? Thank you very much. Well, we certainly, we certainly uh, have uh, high expectations uh, with the Polish presidency. Uh, we have been talking to my uh, colleague and friend Radek Sikorski a lot uh, during the first half of this year on bilateral issues, but also on Russia-EU uh, cooperation. Uh, as you know, we have been in agreement with Poland for quite some time on the small border travel between Kaliningrad area and the adjacent areas of Poland. After very huge efforts, we managed uh, to persuade the Commission in Brussels that the entire Kaliningrad region should be included in the small border travel scheme. Uh, and now we are helping you to persuade Brussels to, uh, to, to, to agree that the uh, comparable area of Poland, including Gdansk, would be covered by this deal. Uh, I think we will succeed, uh, and I think we must succeed under the Polish presidency. Uh, we also hope that uh, another uh, neighboring state, Lithuania, would also accept the same scheme on the same uh, principle, and if uh, Russian-Polish deal would be endorsed, that will create precedent. Uh, not for everything else, but for Kaliningrad area only, because of its unique geographical location. On the new basic treaty, uh, we have been progressing very well. Uh, but now we are stuck because uh, the EU side wants uh, to have the chapter on trade uh, and economic cooperation and investment uh, to be spelled out in so many details. Uh, we believe uh, that all this would be uh, known and would be clear after we become WTO members and that at this stage we can really have a framework agreement. As, as, as far as trade and economy and investments um, uh, go. Uh, and then, after we know on what specific and exact conditions we joined WTO, it would not be too difficult to have a separate additional uh, agreement between Russia and the EU, spelling out the uh, WTO regime, but also adding more uh, concessional treatment, because we agreed already with Brussels that we would have uh, more liberal uh, trade and investment regime between Russia and the EU compared to what we will get 
and the WTO. Of course, this also involves, involves the customs union between Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. So it's not very easy. But for this reason, I believe it is important to make this new basic agreement legally binding, but a framework agreement, to be addition by sectoral, detailed, elaborate agreements after the big one is adopted. We also, the yeah, partnership for modernization is a very promising project. Not only we have signed the deal between Russia and EU, but also more than half of the EU members signed bilateral deals uh, with us on modernization uh, in, in, de in developing, you know, in practical terms, the uh, framework agreement between Moscow and Brussels. Uh, on visa, uh, visa-free regime negotiations are progressing. We are now finalizing discussions on an exhaustive list of steps to be taken by Moscow and by Brussels and EU member states. Uh, and when these steps uh, would, be, would have been taken, the visa-free uh, agreement uh, would be signed. And they just met for another round yesterday, and the agreement, as they reported, is 99% ready on this list of necessary steps. And of course, we want uh, a crisis management agreement with the European Union. It's also uh, in, in a very advanced stage of negotiations. EU just signed a crisis management uh, agreement with the United States. Uh, we cannot just copy it because we have some specific uh, features, including ge geography and so on. But I hope under Polish presidency it would be it would be really possible. The only thing which I'm sorry about is that after the Lisbon Treaty, uh, all summits uh, in the EU are held not in the presidency capital but in Brussels. <laughs> okay, I've, I've got three colleagues to questions. So I'm going to ask you to each ask your question in order. I'm going to put the burden on you to keep track of the questions for a minister, and then we will wrap up because we're supposed to get out of here by 10 o'clock. Next question, please. Identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, I'm Katie Fox. I'm from the National Democratic Institute, which is a non governmental organization. I want to ask Mr. Lavrov at the beginning of your remarks, you said that one of the very important things in today's world is democracy and the rule of law, and you stressed that you meant uh, internationally as well as domestically. Could you expand on what you meant by that? Please go ahead and sit down, and Joe, your, your question. Joe Fitchett from the European Institute. Minister, thank you for your very forthcoming presentation. I wonder if you would elaborate a little bit coming out of the uh, Russia-NATO Council uh, on the question of missile defense. Do you think the way forward is in technical fields, or are, is there something in the form of consultation and reassurances that could open the way to progress on a timetable that maybe you'll give us a hint about your expectations. Thank okay, you. and our last question, please. Hello, Mr. Um, my name is Stan de saint -Hippolyte. I'm from France 24 uh, TV channel. Yesterday's quartet meeting was the latest, the, the last high-level meeting before the vote in September at the UN. What do you think will be the consequences of the vote at the UN? on the Palestinian state, and what might be the result of the vote, according to you? Okay, on, on democracy and the rule of law, I think, I think it's obvious that if we all want uh, each and every country to be based on the principles of democracy and on the basis of the rule of law, uh, we should not forget our obligations internationally. Democracy in international relations means, you know, the principle embodied and enshrined in the UN Charter, one country, one vote. Uh, it's called sovereign equality of states. Uh, and the rule of law means that international obligations must be, must be respected and must take uh, preference over the national legislation. And this is not always the case. And this is wrong. On the NATO Russia Council and missile defense, uh, you know, that's the position of our. Uh, Western partners in NATO Russia, just like it's the position of US uh, negotiators in our bilateral dealings, uh, it cannot be to the detriment of the Russian security. Uh, you have uh, potential uh, which would not be, uh, you know, uh, compromised by the uh, design we have. Uh, so don't have any uh, suspicions. Start practical, technical cooperation with us, and you will see for yourselves that this is not against you. Our response is very simple. First, we agreed both with the United States in 2009 
and with NATO Russia uh, participants in 2010 to start by joint common analysis of the situation. And then on the basis of that analysis, to move forward, to decide on the concept and architecture of the European missile defense system. Because it's after the agreement on how we perceive threats that we would be able to discuss geography of location of those uh, military means necessary to, inter to intercept potential uh, missiles uh, flying in the direction of Europe, and so on. Uh, so, to, to, to they're not even given, uh, giving us a benefit of the doubt as far as our intellectual analytical capacity is concerned. Mm -hmm. So this is not really uh, what common work means. We're being told, no, 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 we can discuss it with you. Yes, we agreed to discuss it with you, but look, this is something which we already decided. So why don't you just sit down and uh, come down and start cooperating with us? Uh, we cannot start this practical cooperation until we have an agreement, a consensus on uh, the concept and architecture of the, of the missile defense. Uh, we want the legally binding firm uh, guarantee assurances, whatever you call them, that the missile defense project in Europe and elsewhere actually for that purpose should not create any threats and risks for the strategic stability which is based on strategic parity. Uh, we also want to discuss jointly the criteria uh, which would you know, be applied to make sure that the declared goal of the missile defense uh, is really respected and followed. And the declared goal being to address potential threats coming from outside the Euro-Atlantic region. And those criteria should be uh, geographical, should be uh, military technical, uh, military people know how to uh, discuss these things. Lastly, on the quartet, uh, I don't think the quartet yesterday was the last high-level meeting, if only because we would all be in New York for the General Assembly. And I'm sure we would have uh, time to consult again. Uh, I didn't mention when I was touching upon the quartet answering the previous question. Uh, it's a pity that, you know, we convened uh, so late, because Russia has been proposing uh, to have the ministerial meeting of the quartet in March, uh, and everyone was considering, and then it wasn't possible for one member of the quartet. The same thing happened in April. Uh, it's good that we met yesterday, and we still have, uh, you know, uh, some things to be finalized, and our experts, as I said, are working on that, and then they would uh, report to us. And the second thing, which I think we should have done, uh, is to in, invite the League of Arab States to the quartet meetings uh, in the person of its Secretary General. It's a very experienced diplomat. Amr Musa is now a presidential candidate in Egypt, but Nabil El Arabi, who was my colleague in New York he, some 10 years ago, and then he was the member of International Court of Justice. Um, he is now the Secretary General, and we want, wanted to invite him because it's very important to have the air of input in all this exercise, which would also be, by the way, more democratic internationally, uh, especially since the Palestinians have uh, brought their previous position uh, last year when they agreed to come back to, to try to come back to negotiations. They had this position, had this position endorsed by the Arab League, and they would certainly consult the Arab League now. So it would only be helpful for, for, for the uh, search of the practical solutions if we go very closely with the Arab League, especially since some time ago the Quartet agreed in principle that we should do such, such meetings. We've come to the hour, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This has been uh, what I expected, I mean, a professional, thorough, candid, and challenging morning, and I'm grateful for it. Let's welcome and thank the Foreign Minister uh, for this morning.